to try to squeeze in one of these rooms. There's there's space. Don't be shy. Okay. Uh, my name is Rachel Silva and I work for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Thank you for coming and welcome to the Sandwiching and History Tour of the Dickinson House. First I want to thank Susan Maddox for allowing us to tour her home today. And Susan, if she's not in here, she's in the back room in her office, so hopefully she can hear us. For any architects in the audience, this tour is worth one hour of continuing education credit through the American Institute of Architects. You can see me or Patricia Blick after the tour if you're interested. The George Ware Dickinson House was built in 1882 and is included in the Governor's Mansion Historic District, which was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. I'm going to tell you a whole lot about the Dickinson family. So if you're near a chair, any of you guys in here, you might want to sit down. <laughs> Seriously, it's okay. <laughs> and everything's full in here. Uh, George Ware Dickinson and his wife, Cordelia Clementine Barker Dickinson, were both from prominent pioneer families. George Ware, who went by G.W. Dickinson, was born in Mississippi on December 26, 1843, to James and Nancy Ware Dickinson. In 1845, the Dickinson family moved to Holly Springs in southeastern Dallas County, Arkansas. Holly Springs is a little bit west of Fordyce, and they farmed near the Washita River. In 1856, the Dickinsons moved to Jackson Township in Calhoun County, Arkansas. Their plantation in Calhoun County was called Oakland Farm and was located near the communities of Somerville and Harrell, which those are in between Hampton and Warren, to give you an idea of where that was located. G.W. Dickinson enlisted in the Confederate Army in 1861 and fought in the Trans-Mississippi Department under Brigadier General William Lewis Cabell until the end of the war in 1865. In 1869, Dickinson married Cordelia Barker, whose family owned the Barcada Plantation in Drew County, Arkansas, and Barcada was west of Monticello. After their marriage, G.W. and Cordelia Dickinson settled at Oakland Farm, and Dickinson assumed control of the family plantation and became the most extensive farmer in Calhoun County, having 600 acres under cultivation. They were all planted in cotton, and he operated his own steam-powered gin. The plantation's cotton was shipped by steamboat on the Washita River to New Orleans. Oakland Farm was a community within itself. According to the 1860 census and the slave schedules, the Dickinsons owned 20 slaves in 1860, and probably more before that and many of those remained on the farm as laborers after the Civil War. G.W. and Cordelia Dickinson had six children, James Barker, Harvey Thompson, Thomas Tiller, Catherine Evelyn, Ruth Ann, and Georgia May. In 1882, the Dickinsons moved to Little Rock and built the house here at 515 West 15th Street in order to give their older children educational advantages. However, for many years, the Dickinsons spent their summer months at the plantation at Oakland Farm. Cordelia Dickinson was very independent and extremely capable of taking care of herself and her family. She was often left with the children here in Little Rock while her husband took care of business on the farm. And in the late 1890s, when her children Thomas, Ruth, and Georgia were uh, attending the Arkansas Industrial University, which was soon to become the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Cordelia temporarily moved to Fayetteville to be with them, and she operated a boarding house up there called the Dickinson Ranch and I looked her up in the 1900 census and that was no joke it was a ranch Dickinson well it was just a big house but she had 22 people living in that house 22 boarders including her three children 
G.W. Dickinson represented Calhoun County in the Arkansas legislature for one term, his wife having announced his candidacy to keep him here in Little Rock at the Capitol all winter, <laughs> but he refused to repeat the experience. Dickinson sold Oakland Farm about 1910 and retired here to this house in Little Rock. He died on February 12, 1912 at the age of 68. His obituary stated that he died suddenly after suffering a heart attack during his daily walk in Forest Park. And you see the streetcar line came right down, 15th Street would have come right in front of this house from Maine. And so it would have been fairly easy for him to step out, get on a streetcar and ride all the way up to Forest Park. And Forest Park was up in Pulaski Heights, near the present-day intersection of Cavanaugh and Taylor Streets. It was about an hour-long ride one way. <coughs> G.W. Dickinson's funeral was held here at the house, and his body was later transported via the Rock Island Railroad down to Harrell in Calhoun County, where he was buried in the family cemetery. After her husband's death, Cordelia Dickinson continued to live here on her own until her own death in 1943 just one month shy of her 95th birthday and y'all she was quite a character so now about her cordelia clementine barker later dickinson was born on july 9 1848 in carroll county tennessee to james and mariah simpson barker cordelia's parents were both from early colonial families in north carolina and virginia respectively in fact cordelia was a cousin to ulysses s grant but being an ardent Confederate, Mrs. Dickinson later said, quote, that branch of the family was not on the right side during the war between the states. <laughs> the Barker family moved in 1855 from Tennessee to Drew County, Arkansas, where they established the Barcada Plantation. Mrs. Dickinson later recalled the three week journey from their home in Tennessee to South Arkansas as being a very important event in her childhood. About 115 people were in their group, including the family, the governess, and the slaves. The men added to the food supplies by hunting and fishing, and the Barker children had lessons from the governess along the way, and keep in mind she was one of 11 children. The convoy crossed the Arkansas River near Little Rock on rafts, and it took them an entire day to get everybody in the group across to the other side, to the south side of the river. The group arrived in Drew County and spent the night in a vacant church building on Christmas Eve, 1855. James Barker named his plantation Barcada after their family name, and a post office was established in the Barker home. The Barker family's governess, Rebecca Kendrick, admitted children from neighboring families to the Barker family school, and the Barkers also employed a physician to work on their plantation. On April 12, 1869, Cordelia Barker married G.W. Dickinson in her father's house at Barcada. Dickinson and his bride lived at his boyhood home at Oakland Farm, and years later, Mrs. Dickinson remembered the beauty of Oakland Farm, saying, quote, Wisteria climbed high in the trees there, and the wild honeysuckle, dogwood, goldenrod, and wild roses made the place a paradise. Dickinson was an active promoter of Methodism, and was known for her hospitality to pioneer ministers. Dr. Augustus R. Winfield, I'm glad you're here, Mike, um, for whom Winfield Memorial Methodist Church in Little Rock is named, was among her guests at Oakland Farm. Even after the Dickinsons built their home in Little Rock in 1882, Mrs. Dickinson spent many summers back at Oakland Farm where she started her own Sunday school and served as its superintendent. I kind of think she did whatever she wanted. <laughs> uh, before she died in 1943, Mrs. Dickinson was the oldest member of the congregation of First Methodist Church here in Little Rock, and she attended Sunday school and the Sunday morning church service each week. Cordelia Dickinson was also an expert at carding and spinning, and her hand-woven materials were on display in the Arkansas building at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. She was an active member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Daughters of the American Revolution. Mrs. Dickinson loved to garden, and she transplanted many trees and flowers from Oakland Farm here at 515 West 15th. And the Arkansas Gazette ran a special interest piece on Mrs. Dickinson in, in 1942, whenever she was 93 years old. And the following paragraph is from that article and kind of gives you an idea of her personality, if you can't already tell. Quote, 
Though she speaks as calmly of dying as of taking any earthly journey, and sometimes as though weary with the weight of so many years, Mrs. Dickinson plans constantly for the future, and her philosophy does not permit her to give up to weariness or illness. Because she feared the next winter might be a severe one, she bought a new fur coat after, at the age of 90, and went alone to have her ears treated because she did not think it necessary to be deaf nor necessary to bother anybody to accompany her. Falling one day in her driveway, she tied a scarf around her head, called a taxi to take her to the doctor to sew up the wound, and her sons didn't know anything about the accident until the next day. She still makes trips alone to see her daughters, who lived in Bentonville and Fort Smith, and occasionally spends a few days in Hot Springs. 93. Even now, she will not take her breakfast in bed and rarely lies down during the day for, quote, she does not want to get bed fast. And I mentioned earlier that G.W. and Cordelia Dickinson had six children. Two of them, two of their sons, James B. Dickinson and Thomas T. Dickinson, they stayed really close to home. The house next door, I know you can't see, but whenever you go outside, take a look at the house next door to the west at 523 West 15th Street. That house was built about 1890 by Dr. James R. Harvey and his wife, Ruth Ann Dickinson Harvey. She was a sister of G.W. Dickinson who built this house. Dr. Harvey was a Methodist minister and he was superintendent for a time of the Arkansas School for the Blind, whenever it was located at 1800 Center Street on the side of the Arkansas Governor's Mansion. About 1914, James B. Dickinson and his wife, Virginia Baker Dickinson, they bought that house next door from the Harveys. It's interesting to note that the house over there originally had a wood exterior built about, you know, 1890. Probably looked very similar to this house originally, but after the Dickinsons bought it, they changed it. They re-bricked the first floor, put a brick veneer on the house, and made it more craftsman in style. James Dickinson was involved with the wholesale grocery business for years. He worked for Plunkett Gerald, Cooper Dickinson, Western States, and Rand Wholesale Grocery Companies, among others. And his wife, Virginia Dickinson, who was known um, to family members as Mama D, was a teacher. And she taught at several elementary schools here in Little Rock, including Rose, Mitchell, Parham, and Reitzel. Thomas T. Dickinson, the other son who I said didn't go very far from home, he stayed here in this house with his mother, Cordelia, and never left. Tom Dickinson, Uncle Tom to family members, was born in 1876. He graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1900 and earned a law degree in 1902. For three years after he graduated from law school, Tom worked as a library clerk in the Arkansas Supreme Court. And his law office was later located in the Pyramid Building at 2nd and Center Streets in Little Rock. By 1920, Cordelia Dickinson rented rooms to boarders here, because keep in mind, you know, I talked about the Dickinson Ranch in Fayetteville, she had experience with that. The 1920 census shows Cordelia, her son Tom, five lodgers or boarders, and one servant here in the house. And the lodgers and boarders at that time were all female, and they were all employed as things like reporters, cashiers, teachers, bookkeepers. In 1930, Mrs. Dickinson still had five people here in the house besides her and her son. But by 1940, only two teachers boarded here at the Dickinson house. Cordelia Dickinson died on June 3rd, 1943, at the age of 94, and was buried in the Dickinson Family Cemetery at Harrell in Calhoun County. After Cordelia died in 1943, her son Tom got married for the first time. And keep in mind, he was about 70 years old then. <laughs> uh, Tom Dickinson and his wife, Martha George Dickinson, <coughs> lived in the house together for about 20 years. Tom died on May 3rd, 1963, and was buried at Mount Holly Cemetery. And Tom Dickinson only had one arm. I've gotten just a couple stories on him from a family member. He had one arm. I saw Richard Butler come in. Where's Richard? Is he back there? Richard, do you know how he lost his arm? Okay. Because I wanted to know, too, and nobody could remember. And I thought, well, how do you forget that? Uh, no, in some sort of accident, he lost his arm, um, and apparently as he got older, he didn't work a whole lot. He would go down to his law office and practice just until he had enough money for the year, and then he'd pack it up and come to the house. Uh, Tom Dickinson's widow, Martha, 
was a registered nurse from Logan County, Arkansas, and she lived in the home until her death on August 17, 1979, at the age of 85, and she was also buried at Mount Holly. About 1980, Martha Dickinson's heirs uh, sold the house to Jerry and Carolyn Staley. In 1992, Susan Maddox signed a lease to purchase agreement with the Staley's, and they closed the following year. And Susan first had her advertising and marketing business here in the house. And although the house was not directly hit by the 1999 tornado that devastated much of this neighborhood, it did suffer some damage. It was slightly kind of turned or jerked around on its foundation. So in all the settling after the tornado, much of the plaster started to crack and things just didn't go back the way they were. Uh, Susan hired architect John Gerard for the home's rehabilitation and conversion into a bed and breakfast. They started work in September 1999 and the Rosemont bed and breakfast opened in April of 2000. A couple interesting facts about the house. In the early 20th century, whenever he was working for both the Arkansas and the United States Geological Surveys, a young Herbert Hoover stayed upstairs in the Dickinson house. And there's a book open to the page over here on this table in this room that has a photograph of the Clintons out on the front porch with a group of people with the Staley's. But Bill Clinton had breakfast here the morning after he was elected president with the Jerry and Carolyn Staley. And the architecture of the house, I know this is not going to mean as much because you're not out front of the house, but the Dickinson house is a good example of vernacular architecture, meaning it was not designed by an architect, and it was built probably with local labor and local materials. According to Susan, no two windows are exactly the same. <laughs> the doors, interior doors are homemade, and the ceiling heights vary slightly from 12 to 14 inches. When we completed in 1882, the house was an L-shaped cottage, meaning like a capital L-shaped cottage. And according to Sanborn Fire Insurance maps, sometime between 1897 and 1913, there was a one-story addition built out this way in the back of the L to kind of fill it in and make it more square. The house features some Italianate-style details, which you can see if you go out front like the mansard-shaped pediments with decorative brackets down below. There's one up above the window in this gable end, and there's another one on the west side of the house that you can't see unless you go over there and just look up. Also, the tall, narrow windows and the bay window in this room. However, the home's colonial revival-style front porch was probably a later addition, maybe circa 1910. The original porch might have featured beveled square columns with Italianate style brackets, but it probably didn't look like that. The original house consisted of the family parlor, which is now the front guest room over here across the hallway that has just had the wood floors uh, refinished, and that's the original board floors in there. Uh, there was carpet over those, so I'll invite you all to just poke your head in there and look, but please do not step inside that front room. Uh, the formal parlor, which was this one, now the, now the living room, the dining room, and then this little open breezeway that you can see back here where you can see the exterior siding of the house through that window. That was a little back porch in the L. And upstairs there were just three bedrooms originally. And sometime around the turn of the 20th century, the main house was connected to a two-story ancillary building straight back and those of you that are in the kitchen you're in the connecting portion but that two-story ancillary had a kitchen downstairs and a servant's quarters upstairs and so then they built what's now the kitchen to connect those two uh, before 1913 i told you already a one-story addition was built going this way um, in the back l of the house in a small two-story section which is right here see where this wall this wall is you're pointing right here this bump out right here on the first and second floor was done at the same time enlarging the size of the dining room and of an upstairs bedroom in the 1930s another small back porch was enclosed where the closed french doors are out that way and a sleeping porch was also built onto the second floor and you'll go out and see the sleeping porch whenever you go upstairs and about 1940 the back living room was added on so and if you go outside the house and walk around it you can tell very quickly that there were many, 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 many additions built onto it. And the house still has its original stamp tin roof though. Make sure to look at that before you leave um, from 1882. And this front room, you can see it really well from the front porch, but it has one of the walk-through windows 
So you could open all the way up and walk through out onto the front porch out of this front family parlor. Other details to notice, the curved staircase, you probably all saw that whenever you came in. The mantles, the original mantles in both of the parlors are pretty ornate. I don't know if you can get a good look at that one because you can't step into that room, but it's, it's pretty. The gesso molding, I know it's in here. It's not as, it may not be gesso in this room, it's not. But whenever you get a chance, you can come in here and see the gesso molding going around the picture rail. And gesso is a material, it's like a, mostly plaster with plaster and glue and some other things put together and molded to make different designs. And this design is different than the gesso upstairs, but that's you know something that's applied to a plaster wall. And then most of the floors, like all the floors in here, were done, besides the obviously new sections like what I'm standing on, were done about 1915. And the good example of the original board floors is in this room that's off limits, but you can look and see. Uh, let's see. Susan's bedroom is off limits. That's through those French doors. Pretty much if any door is closed, please don't open it. There's a reason why it's closed. Um, but I think other than that, and besides not walking on that wood floor in there, you have free reign of everything, including the gardener's cottage, which is the old servants' quarters upstairs. But to get to that, you have to go outside and go up the stairs outside. Or you can go from the second floor, you can get there kind of by walking on the roof. There's a little catwalk. It's not as scary as it sounds. There's railing, there's railing as you go across. Um, but does anybody have any questions while there, we're all? Is there a basement? Not that I know of. She said no basement. Okay, no basement. You said that the house was actually lifted and dropped? When I think it was just kind of, you know, tweaked a little bit on its foundation. Oh. Mm -hmm. Joe? Is that, is that door you're standing in originally? It looks like a different No, shape. it's not. It's been cut out. Mm -hmm. Pretty wide. Uh -huh. Anything else? Mm -hmm. How long did they have the plantation? How long did they have the plantation? They had it until a couple years before G.W. Dickinson died. He died in 1912. So maybe around 1910. Anything else? Yes? When did they, she's asking when did boarding homes disappear? Uh, they didn't, I mean, some of them didn't disappear for a long time, but I mean, pretty much in the late 50s, early 60s, everything started being called apartments and it was different than that boarding style living. That's what I've noticed. Pardon me? She's asking how large was the plantation? Um, I don't have, am I gone on this? There we go. Uh, from what the families told me, it was maybe, it wasn't huge, and they kind of even winced at, at calling it a plantation, but it was just a little over a thousand acres, I think, but with 600 acres under cultivation. So still, you know, a decent sized farm, but he was the most extensive farmer in Calhoun County at that time. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? If you do, you can catch me later. Our um, next tour is August the 1st at the old North Little Rock Post Office, which is now the Argenna branch of the Lehman Library on Main Street in North Little Rock. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you.